Hi, I'm Wright Anderson, and I'm glad that you're back with me again. We're looking at study number 14, which deals with what the Bible teaches about the Sabbath. Now, if you've just accidentally come onto this site and you're looking at this video on whatever platform you're watching it from, uh, this is all part of a 25-part series called The Orchard Faith of Bible Reading Guides. And if you would like this series of Bible reading guides, then we can send them out to you free of charge wherever you live throughout the world, absolutely free of charge. Now, before we continue or before we start our study today number 14 let's commence with a word of prayer actually before I do that I want to thank you whoever you are where you're you might be in one of the Scandinavian countries the United States England France wherever you are I want to thank you for coming back again uh, making this time to continue your study of God's word because it's important and uh, you may be at a lunch break now, or you might be on a tram, you might be on public transport somewhere, you might be at home in your office, it might be the evening when you are, or it might be in the morning, or you might be meeting with a few lady friends and you're all studying this together. Whoever and wherever you are, I want to welcome you, and I know that God's blessing will rest upon you today. Let's, let's pray before we continue on. Father in heaven, we want to thank you that we have this freedom to be able to study your word. And I just ask that as we review and uh, examine the scripture, that each one of us would be more of the people you want us to be and help our minds to be illuminated by the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. All right, here we go. Question number one, and it begins with the subheading, the day of rest given by God. Question number one. What day has God asked us to remember and why? So we're going to Exodus chapter 20. Now you will remember from previous studies that this is where we find the Ten Commandments. And in Exodus chapter 20 in verses 8 to 11 is where we find the Fourth Commandment. So we're going to Exodus chapter 20 and we're looking at verses 8 to 11 here. Exodus chapter 20 and verses 8 to 11. Right, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he hallowed it. The question is asking, what day has God asked us to remember and why? Well, he's asked us to remember the seventh day of the week, the Sabbath day, to keep it holy because it's the memorial of his creative act in the beginning. Now, as I've mentioned a couple of times or a number of times in previous presentations, at any time, just press pause if you want to write down your answers or you need time to write down your answers. I sincerely hope that you are writing down your answers because as I've said in the past, if you can write your answers down, it helps you to be able to more fully understand the, the verses because it's one thing to look at the verse and say, I understand it, but it's another thing entirely to be able to then look at the verse, what it's saying, and then to write the answer down in a coherent fashion. And this will help you in the future as you try to bring back to remembrance the things that you're learning, but also if you desire to share it with other people as well. So writing down your answers is essential in the learning process. And that's why I've set these study guides out the way I have. All right, let's continue on. I shouldn't have said I there because it's my team and I at the Orchard Melbourne Central City Church in Melbourne CBD. Well, let's continue on now. And it asks, in question two, what three things did God do on the Sabbath in creation week? So we're going to Genesis chapter two, the start of the Bible, Genesis chapter two. And what three things did God do on the seventh day of the week, the day that we know is the Sabbath day? Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. 
Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. So after six 24-hour days, God has created the heavens and the earth. And then it says, And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on what day? It's on the seventh day. And it sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. So here we read that God did three things. He blessed it. He sanctified it and he rested on that day. Now, let's begin at the beginning. It says that God rested on that day. It's not because God needed to rest on that day, but he just simply gave us an example that we need to rest on that day. We need to rest one day in seven. It can't be any day on seven. In fact, if you want to, you can rest seven days a week. In fact, you can go to church seven days a week. There's no problem with that. But there's one day that God has rested on, and it's the day that he wants to follow after his example. So that is the seventh day Sabbath. Furthermore here, it actually says that God rested on the day and it says that he blessed the seventh day. So as we study the Bible, uh, we see that what God blesses, the blessing remains on it forever. So the blessing that was given to the seventh day in the beginning is still upon the seventh day today. And we partake of that blessing that God has placed upon it when we partake of the Sabbath day in the right spirit. And then finally it says here that he sanctified the day. And the word sanctified just simply means to set aside for holy use. So we can go to church any day we like. We can actually actually rest any day we like. But there's only one day that God himself has set aside for holy use, has sanctified. And that is the Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week. We can't change it. You can't change it. You know, you can change your name. You can change your appearance, but you cannot change your birth date. That's one thing you can never change. And when we have a look at this passage that we've read here, or passages we've read, we see that the day that God has given us to rest on, the seventh day, he rested, he sanctified it, and he blessed that day. And it cannot be exchanged for another. Let's continue on. How is God distinguished from the false gods of men? Well, let's turn to Jeremiah now, Jeremiah chapter 10. So how is God distinguished from the false gods of men? Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 1 to 5. Now remember, as we go to the middle of the Bible, we have the book of Psalms, we have Proverbs, we have Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, the major prophet, and then we have the book of Jeremiah. We're going to chapter 10 and we're reading from verses 1 to 5 here. Jeremiah chapter 10 and verses 1 to 5. And we read this. Hear the word which the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. Thus he says, do not learn the way of the Gentiles, that is the non-Jews. I'm a Gentile. Most of you are probably Gentiles. Gentiles, as I said earlier, is just referring to non-Jews. Do not learn the way of the Gentiles. And in in this context here, it's the pagans, the ones who worship a myriad of gods, man-made gods. He says, do not learn the way of the Gentiles. Do not be dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the Gentiles are dismayed at them all. For the customs of the people are futile. For one cuts a tree from the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers so that it will not topple. Verse 5. They are upright like a palm tree and they cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot go by themselves. Do not be afraid of them for they cannot do evil nor can they do any good. So how does God contrast or distinguish, or distinguish himself from the false gods? Well, the false gods are made by men's hands and they're made out of the elements that we see in this earth as opposed to a corporeal, a, a real God who walks and talks and who thinks and has personality and create character and who answers prayers and is the creator of all things. But notice what else we read in Acts chapter 17. This is the words of the Apostle Paul. And we remember as we go to the book of Acts that it was written by Luke and it covers the 30 years of the spread of the Christian uh, movement after the death 
and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. But in Acts chapter 17 and verses 23 and 24, we have the Apostle Paul. And Paul is um, in Athens and he's on Mars Hill. And I've been to Mars Hill. I'm not trying to boast, but I have been there. And I've been on the spot where it's purported that Paul was speaking to these wise men, these philosophers there in Athens. And in verse 23 and 24, it says, uh, Paul says this. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. So how is God distinguished from the pagan gods, the gods of the Gentiles, that God is the living God. He is the creator as opposed to the pagan gods which are made by human hands. Let's move now to question four. And as I've said in previous studies, press pause if you need more time to write your answer or if you want to reread a text or if you want to get to the text and you find that found that I've just got there a little bit uh, uh, too quickly for you. All right, question number four. What is the significance of the Sabbath being enforced in Exodus chapter 16, verse 23 to 30? Now, wait a moment. We first read of the, ta- the, uh, the Sabbath as one of the Ten Commandments. That's where the word Sabbath comes up in most people's minds. However, which is on Mount Sinai, after the Israelites have left Egypt and they're about 45 days after Egypt. However, there's an event recorded in Exodus chapter 16 that alerts us to the reality that the Jews knew about the Sabbath well before the time they reached Mount Sinai when God gave them the Ten Commandments and that uh, written in stone by the finger of God. So let's turn to this now. What is the significance of the Sabbath being enforced in Exodus chapter 16, verse 23 to 30? Well, let's go back to it. Exodus, the second book of the Bible, and verse 23 to 30. Exodus chapter 16 and 23 to 30. We read this. Then he said to them, this is what the Lord has said. Now, this is Moses speaking to the Israelites. He says, this is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today and boil what you will boil and lay up for yourselves all that remains to keep it until morning. So they laid it up till morning as Moses commanded and it did not stink nor were there any worms in it. Then Moses said, eat that today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. Now it happened, in verse 27, that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See... For the Lord has given you the Sabbath, therefore he gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man remain in his place, let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the Lord rested on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day there in verse 30. Now, what we learn here is in Exodus chapter 20, God has said that uh, on the sixth day of the week, I will, there will be double there and you can gather in as much that will satisfy your need for the sixth day of the week and also the seventh day of the week because when you go out on the seventh day of the week, there'll be none there. So you'll be able to find enough to satisfy your hunger and the hunger of those within your household for the sixth day and also on the seventh day. But this happened before the Israelites have even reached 
Mount Sinai. But the telling verse here is when we read verse um, 28 in chapter 16, for it says, And the Lord said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Well, God could only say that if he had previously instructed them all the people knew about his commandments and laws. He couldn't say it if it was new on the day, could he? Of course he couldn't. So it's obvious from this passage here that the Jews understood. They knew the requirements of the Sabbath, but God was reminding them of them. And when people went out and broke the Sabbath, after the clear instruction of Moses here, he says, how long are you going to keep this behaviour up for? How long are you going to continue to rebel in this fashion? This is what God is highlighting here. So what's the significance? That the Jews, the Israelites, knew about the Sabbath before they reached Mount Sinai and the Ten Commandments. Well, now we're going to the Sabbath in the New Testament now, remember, a lot of people say that the Ten Commandments were done away with, but uh, were done away with at the time of the crucifixion, and uh, the corollary being that therefore we don't have to worry about the Sabbath anymore. But I want you to notice what we learn as we study the Ten Commandments, and particularly the Sabbath in the New Testament. Question number five: What day did Jesus keep holy? Now, if Jesus is our example in all things, as the Apostle Peter says, and as John says, then surely we should worship on the day that Jesus worships on. Well, let's look at it now. Let's go to Luke, Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. Now, Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. It says this. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, this is Jesus, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. It says here that Jesus went to the synagogue. What's a synagogue? It's just a Jewish church. It says as his custom was, he went, went in on the Sabbath day. So Jesus goes to church on the Sabbath day and it says it was his custom. Now what's a custom? Well, it's something that he did regularly. It's a weekly occurrence. So Jesus went to church on the Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week. Let's look at question number six now. What day did the apostles keep holy? Let's go to the book of Acts. Remember, this is the journal written by Dr. Luke, which covers the 30 years of the Christian movement after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. And we're looking at Acts chapter 13 and verses 13 and 14. And here we read these words. Now, when Paul and his party set sail from Pamphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia and John departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Verse 14 now. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after reading of the law and the prophets, the ruler of the synagogue said to them, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation from the people, say on. So where is Paul and his companions on uh, on this day? Well, they're in the synagogue. And what day is it? It's the Sabbath day. And we're going to read soon that it was actually Paul's custom to continue his worship on the Sabbath day. Have a look at verses um, 20, uh, 42 to 44 in our study guide. And now in the Bible, so chapter 13, verse 42 to 44, it says, So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles, the Gentiles and non-Jews, remember, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now, when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas. Now, let's pause. It talks about proselytes here. Who are proselytes? Well, proselytes are simply converted Gentiles. They are Gentiles who have become Jews. So if I was to become a Jew, I would be identified as a proselyte. It's referring to a convert to Judaism. 
In verse 43, we'll read it again. Now, when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Verse 44, and on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came to hear the word of God. It says that on the Sabbath day, the whole city, well, nearly the whole city, came to hear the word of God. Why? Because it was the day of corporate worship. Now, Acts chapter 13 here is around about 45 AD, something like that. Jesus was crucified 31 AD. So this is around 14 years or thereabouts after the crucifixion, the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. And the disciples are still keeping the Sabbath day holy. Let's look at our next scripture. It's found in, in chapter 16 and verse 13. Now, by the way, we're only just touching the surface here. We could go into a lot of detail on the subject of the Sabbath in the New Testament, but we don't have the time to do it. But just notice the story, the history of the followers of Christ after the resurrection and ascension. And we're looking at verse 13 in chapter 16 now. And here we read, And on the Sabbath day we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made and sat down and spoke to the women who met there. So what does it say? It says that on the Sabbath day they go to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And the reason why they went to the riverside, because this happens in the city of Philippi. And at that time there were no synagogues in the city of Philippi. So where do the believers go? They go to a riverside where they can be surrounded by nature, where prayer was customarily made on the Sabbath day. Let's continue on. We're looking at another text here in Acts chapter 17 and verse 2. And here we read, Then Paul, as his custom was. What's a custom? Yes, it's something that we do regularly. Then as Paul's custom was, this is something that Paul did regularly, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures. So what does it say here? It says that Paul, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. So we see very clearly that there's a continuance in the honouring of the Sabbath day. Now, as we turn the page and we go to page 2, we see that the title here or the subtitle is the Lord's Day. Have you ever heard people refer to Sunday as the Lord's Day? Well, I want to assure you that is not what the Bible actually says. Let's go to uh, question seven because it says, what day did Jesus identify as the Lord's day? Let's turn now to Mark chapter two and verse 27 and 28. So this is Mark two and verses 27 and 28. Mark chapter two, 27 and 28. And here we read this. And he said to them, the son of man, sorry, and he said to them, the Sabbath was made for the Jew. Is that what your Bible says? No, it doesn't. It says the Sabbath was made for man. See, M-A-N, it's a very strange way to spell Jew, isn't it? And there are a lot of Christians today who teach and ministers preach that the Sabbath was made for the Jews. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. In other words, the Sabbath was meant to be a blessing, not to be a burden, but a blessing. And then it says, therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. So here, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now, who is the Son of Man in the Bible? It's Jesus. And it says, Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. So what day is the Lord's day? Yes, it's the Sabbath. It's the day that we call Saturday today. It's not Sunday at all when we study the Bible. In fact, it's very clear that Saturday is the Lord's day. The Sabbath is the Lord's day. What's the other text we have to read here? It's found in Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, the last book of the Bible written by John around 95 AD. And in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10, we read these words. I was, this is John, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, there are some people who say, see, John was worshipping on Sunday. doesn't say that. 
doesn't actually say that at all. It says he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And as we compare scripture with scripture, which is the golden rule for biblical exegesis, for biblical interpretation, as we compare scripture with scripture, then we see very clearly that the Lord's day refers to the Saturday Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. All right, question number eight now. What names do we give to the preparation day, the Sabbath, and the first day of the week today? So what are the names that we give to the preparation day, the Sabbath day, and the first and the, uh, and the first day of the week today? Now, this is in relation to Easter, in relation to Easter. So what day was Jesus crucified? We would say that's Good Friday. And what day did Jesus rise? Well, we would say that is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. All right, with those facts in mind, and the whole Christian world acknowledges that and uh, follows that example, let's turn to the verses found in Luke chapter 23. So we're going back to Luke because it talks about the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus here. But it also assists us in our study on the Sabbath. Let's turn to Luke chapter 23 and verse 56 we're going to read from and we're going to go all the way through to chapter 24 and verse 1. And we may even read a couple of extra verses there as well. So Luke chapter 23 and from verse 56 I'm going to read and I'll explain and ask questions of you as we go. All right. Here we are, Luke 23, verse 56. We read this. Actually, I'm going to start actually at verse 50. Now behold, oh yes, that's where I'm going to start. I'm actually going to start at verse 50 here. Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member and a good man, a just man. And he had not consented with their decision and deed. He was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph here is not to be confused of Joseph, the uh, stepfather of Jesus, because this Joseph is a Jew of Arimathea. He was a just man. It says that he was a council member referring to the Sanhedrin. And when it says that he never or he did not partake in their decision, that refers to their decision to betray or murder Jesus Christ. So he's not part of that. And he may not have even been privy to the initial discussions. Nevertheless, he hasn't gone along with it. And in fact, it's Joseph of Arimathea, this very wealthy man who's gone to Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea, and he's pleaded for or pled for the body of Jesus. Verse 53. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of rock where no one had ever lain before. That day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. Now, what day was Jesus crucified according to the Bible? It says that it was the preparation day. Now, what day do we call the preparation day today? Well, we call it Good Friday. It's Friday. But the Bible says here, verse 54, that that day was a preparation day and the Sabbath drew near. In other words, the Sabbath day, the biblical Sabbath follows the day that we call Good Friday. But let's keep reading. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. So what does it say here that they did? It says that they rested on the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Notice verse 1, now of chapter 24, now on the first day of the week, what do we call the first day of the week? Sunday, we call it Easter Sunday. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. Verse 2 and 3, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. So, what have we discovered? We've discovered that the day that we call Saturday today is the day that the Bible writers identified as the Sabbath 2,000 years ago. And in fact, when we practice Easter today, when we participate in Easter today, we're actually acknowledging 
that Saturday is the Sabbath day because we've read in the Bible here in Luke chapter 23 and Luke chapter 24 that the women rested according to the commandment and the resting on the Sabbath day according to the commandment followed the day of Jesus' crucifixion which was the Good Friday event and then we see that after the Sabbath had passed very early in the morning on the first day of the week so we see on the first day of the week which is what we call Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday So the day in between the preparation day and the resurrection day is the day that the Bible calls the Sabbath and it's the day that we call Saturday. And it's just as simple and as clear as that. There is no doubt at all that we, when we acknowledge the Sabbath, we, when we identify it as Saturday, we're in accordance with what the Bible taught and teaches. All right. Let's continue on to our next uh, question. And it says, the Sabbath is a sign between God and his people. Question number nine. How is the Sabbath identified? Well, let's turn to our first reference here. It's found in Exodus. And you remember it was Moses who wrote the book of Exodus about 1450 BC or thereabouts. And we're in Exodus chapter 31 and we're looking at verses 16 and 17. Exodus chapter 31 and verses 16 and 17. All right. And here we read this. Therefore, the children of is the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual sign. Now, when reading this, you may say, well, it's talking about the Israelites there. It's talking about the Jews. But remember that we have already discovered that the Sabbath was instituted at the time of the creation of this world, as it says in Genesis chapter 2. Uh, even before a Jew stepped foot on the earth, it was given to all mankind. Jesus talks about the Sabbath being a blessing for all mankind, not a particular um, uh, nationality or ethnicity, ethnicity. But despite that, when we read this text, we can see that the blessing is meant to extend for every nation, kindred, tongue and people. So it says here in verse 16, Therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generation as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So it is a sign between God and his people. So in answer to uh, question number nine, how is the Sabbath identified? It's identified as a sign between God and his people. Let's continue on now. We're going to the book of, um, of Ezekiel, uh, one of the major prophets after Isaiah. It's after Jeremiah in Lamentations. And then we come to the book of Ezekiel. And also, please don't forget to pause if you don't have time to write all your answer down before I proceed, or if you're finding it hard to keep up in relation to the looking up of the verses, uh, again, just press pause until you get there and, uh, and then off we go. We'll, we continue on together. So we're looking at Ezekiel chapter 20 and we're looking at verses 12 and 13 now in our study together. All right, Ezekiel chapter 20 and verses 12 and 13. No, we're looking at verses 12 and 20. Okay. Moreover, it says, I gave them my Sabbath. So this is God speaking to the prophet Ezekiel. And he says, Moreover, I gave them my Sabbath that they might know that I... I'll start again. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. You see, the Sabbath was intended to be a sign between God and his people that he is the one who sanctifies them, who separates them for holy use, who prepares them for the life to come, etc., etc. Let's look at verse 20 now. And it says that God commands, Hallow my Sabbath. And that the word hallow there means just to keep holy. Keep holy my Sabbath, and they will be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. So again, it is a sign between God and his people. Let's go to question 10 now. Why did Jesus believe the Sabbath would be kept after 
after his death? Or why did Jesus believe the Sabbath would be kept after his death? Let's look at Matthew chapter 24. Now, in, as we're turning to Matthew chapter 24 and verses 15 to 20, we recognize and remember from previous studies that Matthew 24 is an eschatological chapter. It's one of many that are found in the Bible. And remember, eschatology is just the Greek word or just Greek transliteration for last day or end time events. So Matthew 24 is one of the eschatological chapters in the Bible, as is Mark 13, Luke 21, etc. We go to the book of Revelation. There are a number of eschatological chapters there as well. But we're looking here at Matthew 24. We're reading from verse 15. And Jesus says this. He says, Therefore... When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy prophet, holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Now, before we go any further, I'd like you to understand that, that the book of Daniel is a very, very important book to understand. All of the Bible is important to understand, but the book of Daniel is the only book that Jesus recommended that we understand because of the consequences of the chapters regarding eschatology that are found within its pages. Now, remember, the book of Daniel was written between 600 and 550 years before the time of Christ, but it has importance for the days in which we find ourselves today. All right, but let's continue on. Verse 15 again, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, Whoever reads, let him understand. Let, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is in the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Let's stop for a moment because here Jesus is identifying two events. Matthew 24 has a twin focus. It deals with the events surrounding the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and the temple and also the last day events which precede the second coming or his second coming. And Jesus says here, in relation to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and Jerusalem itself, which happened in 70 AD by the general Titus and the Romans, it says, but woe to those in verse 19 who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days and pray that your flight may not be in winter. Why that it not be in winter? Because it's difficult to travel in winter or on the Sabbath. Now, why did Jesus say or on the Sabbath? Well, for two reasons. First of all, because the gates of the city were, are locked in Jerusalem or were locked at that time. Uh, so they would not be able to escape. And the second thing is, it's a day of rest. So they could have easily been surprised. So here Jesus is saying, pray that you're not, your flight not be in winter, nor on the Sabbath day. But remember, Jesus is describing events that were going to happen in 70 AD. Jesus was crucified. He died. Matthew 24 was spoken of in in. Uh, AD 31. This is 39 years later that Jerusalem would be de destroyed. Therefore, the conclusion that we can come to from this is that Jesus believed that the Ten Commandments would still be kept even after his death and resurrection. More to the point, Jesus still believed that the Sabbath would be kept 39 years after his crucifixion and resurrection as well. I hope that's clear. Let's go to our last question. Now, question number 11 in the first section. When will the redeemed come together to worship God? Let's go to Isaiah, Isaiah 66. And remember, Isaiah is right in the middle of our Bible. We're going to Isaiah 66. And we're looking at verses 22 and 23. So when will the redeemed, that is the saved in the life to come, come together to to worship God, chapter 66 and verse 22 and 23, we read this. For as the new heavens and the new earth, let's pause for a moment. 
in a future study, we're going to be talking about the new heavens and the new earth. We're going to be talking about it in relation to the 1,000 years of Revelation chapter 20 and also that topic known as the millennium. And that's all going to come together then. However, we read this passage here in verse 22. It says, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I, shall, which I make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. So here in this amazing prophecy, God is telling Isaiah that the redeemed in the life to come will come and worship before him. When? From one Sabbath to another Sabbath. What is this telling us? It's telling us that the Sabbath is going to be continued to be kept throughout eternity. Now, where did we get that from? Well, we've got it from the Bible. We've got it from God's Word. Nobody can say I made it up. You've read it and I've read it. It comes from Holy Writ. All right, let's continue on now. We know what the Bible says about the Sabbath day. We know that it should be kept. But describe now, here we go, we're going to the summary section. Describe the personal benefits of keeping the Sabbath. All right, so for you personally, what would be the benefits in you honouring and remembering the Sabbath day? Turning now to our reflection question, don't forget to hit pause on your device if you need more time to write your answers or to look up a text. Reflection section, remembering that the reflection area of our study is asking us, now that we've learnt what the Bible says on the Sabbath, how do we apply it in our own life today, in the world in which we find ourselves? And the question is asked here, how is delighting in the Lord and Sabbath keeping connected? So how is delighting in the Lord, enjoying the presence of God, how is he delighting in the Lord and Sabbath keeping connected? Well, what we discover is that there's a whole day that is set aside for that purpose. It's not about one hour on one day from 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock or 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. It's not like that at all. It's about a whole day, a block of time that has been set aside that we can immerse ourselves in the presence of God through the Bible, fellowship with other people, along with prayer and uh, responding to the Holy Spirit. Now, question number two, why should we obey God before men? Well, if men say that we should be worshipping on Wednesday and it becomes a law that we should worship on Wednesday, why should we obey God before men? So that's the question for you to answer. My resolution. I believe that Sabbath, Saturday, is the day God wants me to remember and worship on corporately. I am coming to church this Sabbath. Now, I don't know where you live. You might be living in Nova Scotia. You may be in, in, um, um, in uh, some parts of Europe. But somewhere around you, if you go onto the internet, you're going to find a Sabbath-keeping church. And if you find that Sabbath-keeping church, please endeavour to, to um, worship at that church. Now, if you're ever in Melbourne, come to my church, the Orchard, the Melbourne Central City Church uh, in the city, and uh, for all the contact details, go to our website, theorchardmelbourne.org.au. But we would love to see you uh, as you continue your growth and your development in the Lord. But uh, the resolution. So if you accept that, write your name and then uh, with your signature as well. Let's go to the additional study section as we put a little more meat on the study under question. Overview. The seventh day Sabbath was given to mankind as a day of rest at the creation of this world. Abraham respected it and the Hebrews knew about the Sabbath before Moses received the Ten Commandments from God at Sinai. The Sabbath was kept by Jesus. The Sabbath was honoured by men and women at and after Jesus' crucifixion. The Sabbath was kept by the apostles. The Sabbath will be kept in the life to come. The Sabbath cannot be changed. 
No person can change the Sabbath or, or of, sorry, nobody can change the day of worship ordained by God. The Sabbath is the memorial to God's creative act. It reminds all mankind that we were created in the image of God. Malachi 3.6 Furthermore, no individual or institution has the authority to substitute the Sabbath day ordained by God for any other day, no matter what the reasons may be. Jesus is our example. According to the Apostle Peter, Christians should follow the example of Jesus Christ. Jesus kept the Ten Commandments of his Father and kept the Saturday Sabbath. In fact, not only was it Jesus' custom to worship on the Sabbath, but he warned about substituting the teachings of God, the Ten Commandments included, for the teachings of man. The Lord's Day. Jesus himself recognized Saturday Sabbath, or recognized the Saturday Sabbath as his day, thus identifying the Sabbath as the Lord's Day. The Bible identifies the Sabbath, Saturday, as the seventh day of the week in several texts. Saturday in the Hebrew language means rest and is the seventh day of the week. In 107 different languages around the world, the word for Saturday is Sabbath. It was Pope Sylvester, Bishop of Rome from 314 AD to 335 AD, who officially authorised the title the Lord's Day to be associated with Sunday. But Sunday is not the Sabbath, the day of rest. The expression first day of the week appears eight times in the New Testament and each time it is at identifying Sunday. The term first day of the week is not attributed to any religious meaning in the Bible as we turn the page. In contrast, the New Testament uses the word Sabbath or Saturday 59 times, which means rest and always has a religious imperative associated with it, even after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. How was this change carried out? The Bible predicts serious attacks against the holy law of God. The change was done neither by Christ nor the apostles, but it came little by little, beginning in Rome and then Alexandria, as a reaction to anti-Jewish sentiment among the general populace with and the Roman authorities. Constantine's decree. Nevertheless, throughout Christendom, the day of rest was the Sabbath until the Roman Emperor Constantine, in his famous decree of 321 AD, commanded all the judges should rest the people of the cities and the trades of all the arts in the venerable day of the sun. This was the first civil law to enforce Sunday worship at the Council of Laodicea in 364 AD. An ecclesiastical seal of approval was given to the civil law by the church and Sunday became the recognised day of worship. Nevertheless, Christians throughout the empire continued to keep the Sabbath in large numbers until a final violent spate of persecution was unleashed during the 12th century. What historians have said, Socrates, now this Socrates here is not to be confused with Socrates of Greek fame, of Plato, the teacher of Plato. Uh, this is another 800 years later. But Socrates, the Byzantine historian, wrote, Although almost all churches throughout the world celebrate the sacred mysteries on the Sabbath of every week, yet the Christians of Alexandria and at Rome, on account of some ancient tradition, refuse to do this. John ne Johann Neander, 1789 to 1850, the German theologian and church historian, wrote, the festival of Sunday, like all other festivals, was, o was always only a human ordinance and it was far from the intentions of the apostles to establish a divine command in this respect, far from them and from the early, early apostolic church to transfer, transfer the laws of the Sabbath to Sunday. Perhaps at the end of the second century, a false application of this kind had begun to take place, for men appear by that time to have considered labouring on Sunday as a sin. Sabbath to Sunday has no biblical authority. William Prynne, who lived from 1600 to 1669, lawyer and historian, wrote, 
It is certain that Christ himself, his apostles and the primitive Christians for some good space of time did constantly observe the seventh day Sabbath. Thomas More, who lived from 1651 to 1715, Church of England minister, wrote this. The primitive Christians had great veneration for the Sabbath and spent the day in devotion and sermons. And it is not to be doubted that they derived this practice from the apostles themselves as appear by several scriptures to that purpose. Dr. Lyman Abbott, for, who lived from 1835 to 1922, wrote this. The current notion that Christ and his apostles authoritatively substitute the first day of the week for the seventh is absolutely without any authority in the New Testament. Why does it matter? As Christians who love Jesus Christ and understand we are saved by grace, we view the Bible as God's inspired word and is to be obeyed as such. When God created the world, he gave mankind the Sabbath as a 24-hour period of time so we could become more personally acquainted with the purposes and character of God our Father. The Sabbath is the memorial to God's creative act and reminds us that we are made in His image, which is why the first, fourth commandment begins with the word, Remember. Amen. Well, You've completed study number 14 now and we're well on our way as we make our way through this series. And I think and I hope that uh, your, your, um, your knowledge pool of the Bible is increasing in leaps and bounds. Don't forget, go over any one of these studies again. In fact, go over them numbers of times because there will be more things that you study as you immerse yourself in the scripture and as you reread these additional study areas. Now, there's one other thing that I want to uh, say to you, and that is, please remember when you're doing these guides to write in your answers. I know that I've harped on this, but please do it because it's very important. Now, next time we meet, we're going to be doing study number 15, which is entitled, What the, Bi what? Hmm. What the Bible Teaches About Keeping the Sabbath Holy. So this is pro probably brand new to you. You've never known about the Sabbath. You've never, under, excuse me, you've never understood that it's a 24-hour block of time that God intends us to keep. So just how do we keep it holy? What are the things that we can do and what are some of the things that we should avoid on that day? Well, this study guide will answer those questions and more. So I look forward to being with you next time as we go through this study. Well, uh, as our custom is, let's close in prayer. We've asked for the Lord's blessing and he has blessed us. And I hope you feel that blessing as you've gone through that study. And now we're going to close in prayer. Father in heaven, I just want to acknowledge you. I thank you for the Sabbath day, the wonderful day of rest that you've given every man, woman and child on planet Earth. And I pray that as we reflect on the teachings of your word, that we will, we will eagerly Look for a time and a place where, and an opportunity where we can keep the Sabbath holy, that we may find a congregation, that there may be a group uh, close to our listeners or a group close to our uh, watchers on, the, on video here that they will be able to yoke up with, that they'll become a part of our Sabbath-keeping community and receive the blessings and the peace of mind that come from proper worship. I thank you, Father, for... Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. I thank you for your mercy, your goodness and your grace and I pray that you'll be with each one of our listeners and each one of our viewers as they make their way from uh, this point on. In the name of Jesus Christ I pray, Amen. Well, it's wonderful to be with you again. Remember this, the truth has nothing to fear from investigation. I'm Rod Anderson. Goodbye for now. <laughs>